Thanks, guys. Thank you, guys. Be seated. Yeah, thank you. God bless Texas. We'll take that. Um, I want to talk to you this morning about truth as a word and, and really where we are in the culture. Truth is under attack in a way that we have not seen in our lifetime. And I would say the truth really is on life support. And I don't use that as political hyperbole. I'm not given to that. I do that because we do a lot of statistical research, work with people like George Barn and others on polling. And what we know nationally right now is when you look at, at the nation right now, three out of five Americans say there's no absolute moral truth. Now, the problem with this is no nation has ever survived this, ever. Because if you can't get a majority of the nation to agree on what's right and wrong, then laws mean nothing. Laws have absolutely no impact. You can't enforce laws where the 60% of the people don't agree that the law is right. And that's where we are. And it's even worse when you look forward. For example, if you look at millennials, which is the next generation to everything, uh, next generation teachers and political leaders and ministers, et cetera, it, with millennials, it's four out of five millennials who think that there's no absolute moral truth. But the good news is at least the Christian community is there because only one out of two Christians think that there's no absolute moral truth. What? Now, I would think, wait a minute, Ten Commandments? That's kind of absolute moral truth. Apparently, for half of Christians, the Ten Commandments are the Ten Suggestions because there's no absolute moral truth. So it is a difficulty. As a result of that, uh, objective truth doesn't matter anymore in so many areas. Now, I'm very involved politically. We have a network of about 1,000 state legislators from across the country, monitor 110,000 pieces of legislation this year at the state level. We see the battles that are going on. We're very involved in, in so many other uh, arenas as well. And so seeing what's happening at that level, you know, five years ago, nobody wondered about how many genders there are. And by the way, if you still live in the country, like I'm a cowboy from Texas, if you live on a ranch, you know there's only two genders. I mean, there's nothing, <laughs> that's all there is. We don't know how many there are now because as of last November, the LGBTQ movement is now the LGBTQIA plus movement because there's somewhere north of 90 different genders. And so we just have to put the IA plus to cover up. So we, we don't know absolute truth on, on anything related to gender. The same when it comes to religion. Uh, all religions are equally good. As a matter of fact, right now, polling shows us that 80% of Christians think that you can get to heaven other than through Jesus Christ. So that's even among Christians. Uh, all forms of government are equally good. Even though we've had a constitutional republic, everything else works well. So if we become socialist, Marxist, communist, it's going to work equally well. And, and so now we're no longer really concerned about maintaining the only form of government that's, that the longest lasting government in, America, in world history is the American government. Same thing with education. Uh, states now no longer use standardized achievement tests that all 50 states use. Every state has its own because I don't really want to compare myself with somebody else. I don't want to say that Texas is 45th or 2nd or 30th, whatever. So every state has its own standards now. So we can't compare ourselves with one another to see who's really doing what. Uh, the same thing with morality. I've already mentioned that. History, we cancel the history we won't like. And we just make up stuff we do like. And so we teach whatever. And so we've seen the battles going on all the local school boards across the country. What, what are we going to teach? What's true? What's not true? We have the same thing with science. We pick and choose science. We don't really follow science. We follow the science that holds up our opinions. And so whatever our opinions are, we'll go with that science. And we're not going to listen to your opinions. And doesn't matter if you have science behind you. So we have debates over science. We have the same thing over economics. It's interesting. Uh, right now, 75% of college students want to replace America's free market economic system with socialism. 69% of millennials and 41% of all Americans. Now, just ignore the fact that for 5,800 years of recorded history, there's not a single example in history where socialism ever worked. We just need to try that in America because we'll get it right. No, we won't. And so we're, we're the thing where that, well, if, if we think it's good, it's going to work fine. It's not going to work fine. The same with ethics. So it doesn't matter where you are. What's happened is truth and fact has been replaced with personal opinions. My opinion is more important than truth and fact. So what I want to speak about this morning is having a love of the truth. And to do that, I want to go to a passage in 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. It has a conflict there between the man of truth and the man of lawlessness. And this conflict goes along. And I like the way that that passage ends because at the conclusion, 
after the man of truth is making his points and the man of lawlessness says, no, that's not right. What it says is in verse 10, they did not receive the love of the truth. Having heard the truth, they didn't agree with it. They didn't like it. They didn't receive the love of the truth. Verse 11 says that for this reason, God will send them strong delusion. So if you reject truth, here comes a strong delusion that they might believe the lie. And verse 12 says that all might be damned who believe not the truth. Now damned is the King James word for condemned or judged. But notice the sequence that you have here. If you don't love or if you reject the truth, if you refuse to accept the truth, even if, if, even if it disagrees with what you personally believe, if you refuse to accept the truth, then what happens is a delusion enters. When a delusion enters, you will then believe a lie and then you will act on that lie and it will have high cost and consequences. Now, there's lots of examples of this. Let me take you into science. I was a math and teacher for a long time. I was a principal of the school. And so math and science is my gig. And we have people like Newton, uh, who has the laws of gravitation. And by the way, we call them the laws of gravitation because they're not personal opinions. They are laws. The thing in science is a law is something that has never been violated once, not in ever, not in all of history. If it's ever violated even just one time, if it's right 99.999% of the time, it's not a law. It has to be 100%. If it's violated even once, it's no longer a law. It's a theory or an axiom or a principle. So a law means it's never been violated and it won't be violated. Now, what happens is I am fully aware of how much progress we've made in technology today. I mean, we're talking right now about placing a woman on the moon. We've had men on the moon, have a woman on the moon. We're gonna put Americans on Mars. I was talking to Charlie Duke, who was on Apollo 16, one of the moonwalkers. He was number 10 out of the 12 moonwalkers. He's the youngest. And Charlie held up his little smartphone and said, you know, there's more technology in this phone right here than we had in rooms of computers when we went to the moon back at NASA. All those rooms of computers don't have as much technology as we got right here. And so we have, we have made so much progress in technology that I'm really not sure that, that gravity is the force that it, that to be reckoned with like it has been. I mean, as a matter of fact, the more I think about it, I, I'm not sure that gravity is something to reckon with at all. Okay, once I get to this point, notice what happens. If I get to this point where I say, there's no law of gravity, then the next thing is, well, the law of gravity sure doesn't affect me. And if it doesn't affect me, then I can do what I want. And quite frankly, I've always wanted to be able to jump off a building and soar. And so I am going to jump off a building and I am going to soar all the way till I splat on the sidewalk below and I will die. And what happens is I bought into this thing where that I rejected the truth. Once I reject the truth, a delusion enters. I'll start acting, behaving, and it, it can be a moral truth. It can be a truth out of God's word. I don't agree with that. I don't agree with what you guys say about whatever it is. And a delusion enters, you'll believe a lie, you'll act on it, it's high cost and consequences. And it really doesn't matter how sincere I am. I can believe it with all of my heart. It doesn't matter what I believe with all of my heart. If it's a law, it is never going to change. That's the way it is. Truth is, that's what it is. And it doesn't matter what my personal opinion is or how strongly I believe it or how many of my friends believe it. You have to go with absolute truth. So absolute truth is what I wanna deal with and talk about for a minute. And for Christians, we know that absolute truth, we have several places we can go to understand what that is. For example, we go to John 17, 17. Scripture says, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. So that's a good source of truth, God's word. We also know in John 14, 6, Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except by me. So there's another source of truth, same source of truth, God's word and the person of Jesus Christ. So that's, a, that's the source of truth we should start with. And from that, everything else flows outward. Now, the problem we have with truth today, and this is why so many Christians are in this fix of not being sure what truth is on religion or anything else, is that we don't know his word, even though that's a source of truth. Right now, we know that only 9% of Christians read the Bible on a daily basis. So if you're not reading the standards of truth, you're not gonna recognize the standards of truth. And my opinion then becomes important because I, I haven't read the source of truth. That's the absolute source of truth. But on top of that, only 6% of Americans have a biblical worldview. So only 6% of Americans see things the way that God sees things, the great creator of the universe. He's told us all this information on every area out there. That's a book that deals with economics. It deals with education, deals with military, it deals with immigration, deals with anything you want to cover. God took a bunch of slaves out of Egypt that had been slaves for 400 years that thought like slaves, act like slaves, behave like slaves. He got them out in the wilderness and said, okay, guys, nobody's chasing you. You have not a clue where you're going, so let me tell you what's going to happen. 
He gave them 613 laws. Based on those 613 laws, they became a backward nation of slaves to the greatest empire in the ancient world because the 613 laws dealt with every single aspect of life. And by the way, it's amazing that Christians today can't put Bible verses to simple things like Jesus did when he talked about the minimum wage or what Jesus says about the cap, or what the Bible says about the capital gains tax, what the Bible says about progressive income taxes versus capitation tax. Bible is so good on economics, but we don't even know it today. So only one out of 16 actually can see things the way that God has laid them out. And so as a result, this is where our personal opinions now are supreme. We've got nothing better to base it on than our opinions because we don't know what God's opinion is on most of these things. And this is where our culture is getting into a lot of difficulty. Let me take you to some things that are going on in the news. Um, you may recall that about 16 months ago, we started this crusade on, on taking down statues and attacking the culture and going after stuff. Probably the first statue to come down was a statue of Christopher Columbus. It was one of the first ones that came down and it was followed by so many others across the nation. And as you look at Christopher Columbus, why would we tear down a statue of Christopher Columbus? We have state holidays and federal holidays, Columbus Day, now those are being replaced now by Indigenous People Day. So we're moving away from Christopher Columbus and why are we doing that? If you don't know why Christopher Columbus is a bad guy that we need to move away from, then you need to do a quick search, on, just do a web search and you'll find all sorts of memes like this one. It says, I don't always celebrate enslavement and genocide, but when I do, it's Columbus Day. Say Columbus is, this is, not only was he into enslavement and genocide, we're told he's the first sex trafficker in the history of the world. So this is a bad dude. Another one, uh, savage, stop the genocide, racism, imperialism, stop the celebration, create hope for a new world. You gotta get away from this guy because he's so bad. And this is why we're getting rid of Columbus Day and we're going to Indigenous People Day. Now, interesting thing about that, Columbus with this record, of course, the statues are coming down and I can just show you statue after statue after statue across the nation where we've been taking it down, we've been destroying it. I mean, Columbus is a bad dude. By the way, how many Columbus statues are there? 600. Can you name any other person that has 600 statues? That's interesting. Why does Columbus have more statues than anybody else? And does this mean that every generation before this one accepted and endorsed and embraced genocide and racism and sex trafficking? Well, that doesn't make sense. We had a generation that was so against slavery that we fought a civil war. I mean, we're the only, America's the only nation in history that where whites fought whites and freed blacks as a result. And, and by the way, let me just back up. There's no nation in the world that had any major reach in the, that abolished slavery before America did. And by 1804, every northern state had passed an abolition law. Now, nobody did it before America by 1804. In March of 1807, America signed the first law to ban the international slave trade. We're the first in the world to sign a law banning the international slave trade. And by the way, in 1819, Congress appropriated money where we sent an entire naval squadron to sit off the coast of Africa and cruise the coast of Africa and make sure that no other nations could come to Africa and take slaves out of Africa. Now, didn't work totally because Africa is thousands of miles long. One squadron can't cover thousands of miles back then with the technology they had. Great Britain joined us to their credit, and so Great Britain and America, we patrolled the, the coast of Africa to stop slaves. We stopped hundreds and hundreds of slave traders from going to Africa, taking out slaves. Didn't get it all, but we were making that effort. America became the fourth nation in the world to abolish slavery. In 1865, when we won the Civil War, hundreds of nations in the world, America was the fourth to abolish slavery. Now think about it, that's only 150 years ago, and we're the fourth nation in the world to abolish slavery. America's done a whole lot of things right. Now, we've had our blemishes, had our things wrong. The problem is we don't know much about our own history. As a matter of fact, we don't even know much about world history. Did you know there's 193 nations in the world today? 94 of them still allow slavery. 94 nations have not banned slavery to this day, which is why we have over 40 million active slaves in the world right now. 9.2 million in Africa. We know at least 3 million in China. There's more than that, but that's what we can document. China doesn't let you have records. I mean, we, we have more slaves today by three than what we had in the 400 year history of the slave trade. The slave trade, 12.7 million taken out of Africa between 1501 and 1875. We've got three times more than that slavery today. If we're really concerned about slavery and racism, let's look at what's happening now, not what happened 300, 400 years ago. But that's not what most people know about today. Now, 
Six years ago, a guy named Glenn Beck started an organization called the Nazarene Fund to save persecuted Christians out of the Middle East. I'm on the board of that, help run that. We're running operations in Afghanistan now. We've gotten thousands of people out. There are thousands of Christians that are being sought and persecuted on the list that are still being looked for. Um, just last week, there was a Bible study going on. Taliban broke in, found the Bible study, murdered every single person there. They take Christians and turn them into actual literal slaves, also into sex slaves over the last Four years, we've gotten several hundred thousand people out of the hands of ISIS and gotten them to all sorts of safe places across the world. We're actively fighting slavery. As a matter of fact, two of our guys have been killed in operations to go and taking slaves. One of our guys has been shot 17 times. He keeps going back because he hates slavery. There's slavery in the world right now. We need to be focused on what's going on. It's fine to know history, and America has a history of slavery, no question, but you should tell the good, the bad, and the ugly. You tell everything. You tell the whole truth about what happened, not just pick and choose history. So back to Columbus, you can't say that we had 600 statues because everybody before us was racist and tolerated this stuff. So if that's not it, then maybe there's more to the story. What is the real story? Or What's the history, or better yet, based on what we're talking about this morning, what's the truth about Columbus? Now, let me take you back to Columbus. The truth about Columbus, the first question I would ask you about Columbus is, how many voyages did he make? Well, it doesn't matter, because he was a bad guy on all of them. My first, and we ask this to young people all the time, it doesn't matter, he's bad. If you don't even know how many voyages he made, you don't even have the basic fact from which to examine whether he did what is claimed. So he made four voyages, and here's the deal about those four voyages. On those four voyages, they involved more than 10,000 people. Those people kept records. There were ministers, um, there, there were military guys, there were doctors, there were settlers, there were business people. There's records galore. They're in the library in Spain. Spain is who sponsored his trips, and so it's a library there. Uh, there's also things like, this is his son, this is his son Diego, and this is the second piece ever done on Christopher Columbus. This is Diego taking his father's writings and took those writings and published them. So we have the original writings as given us by the son of Christopher Columbus. Spain has the original letters there. You also have guys like Washington Irving. He was a diplomat to Spain for America. Nearly 200 years ago, he spent years in the Spanish library going through and reading about Columbus, studying the records of those who went with him, the records of settlers, etc. Came out with three, this three volume set, authoritative work on Christopher Columbus and those voyages and what happened. Now, what happens today is what I'm about to share with you most Americans have never heard. And this is the way you change history. It's not that you change it, you go silent about it for about 30 years. And after you've been silent, then you can reintroduce a totally different narrative. You see, the CRT narrative that's going right now didn't work 30 years ago because we knew too much about our own history. The Christopher Columbus stuff that's going now wouldn't have worked back in the 80s because we knew too much about Christopher Columbus. What's happened is the nation no longer teaches history very well at all, and because we don't, we can now move the culture in a totally different direction. This is where having originals really helps, and this is why truth is so important. So let's go back to Columbus. His first voyage starts landing, and this is the painting that is in the rotunda of the U.S. Capitol. This painting is 14 feet high, it's 20 feet wide in the Capitol. It's a life-size painting of Columbus. Columbus lands there in the New World, as it's called, and the first people he encounters are a native tribe called the Taino. The Taino, he loved them, he wrote about them, he said, these are the best people ever. He said, this is the gentlest and kindest people I've, I've ever met. He tells the king and queen of Spain, these guys are wonderful. They need to have full protection, full equality. This is a great people. So he has great relations with the Tainos, and the Tainos appreciate that, and they like Columbus, and things go really well, and they get along well. And the Tainos say, however, you need to recognize we're not the only tribe in the islands. There are other tribes as well, and they tell them about their enemy, which is called the Cannibs of the Caribs. Now, Cannibs and Caribs is where we get the name Cannibal and Caribbean. So this is the mortal enemy of the Tainos, which is now Columbus's friend and ally. And Columbus hears about all this cannibalism, and he said, nah, he just didn't buy that. He, come on, this is 1492. Who in 1492 eats somebody? Come on, we're too civilized for that. And that literally was his attitude. But having found this great relationship with the Taino people, he says, let's go back and get more people. Let's bring more. This is great. We're all going to live together. And, and so he makes a plan to return for supplies. 
And on, on the return, as they start the return, one of the ships runs aground. It damages the ship so bad it can't make it back to Spain. So all the crew on that ship, there's not enough room for them on the other ships. So he said, okay, guys. He said, Tainos, they're great people. This is going to be great. We'll leave you here. We'll be right back. We're just going to Spain, reload quick supplies. We're coming back. And so what they do is they build them a fort. And in building the fort, he says, no big deal, back shortly. And so he then takes off. Now, what happens is right after he leaves, the Canabs, the Caribs show up. And the Taino weren't there at the time they showed up. And so they promptly killed every one of Columbus's men and they cannibalized all of them. Uh, apparently the first thing they do is scoop out the eyeballs because they think that's a delicacy. And so the Taino get back as they're cannibalizing these guys. The Taino engage with the Canabs and chase them off. Then Columbus makes it back. So Columbus comes back after all these guys have been cannibalized and eaten and butchered. And he gets there and when he, when he comes back and he finds everybody dead, he goes to the Taino and says, what happened? What, 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 what happened? Remember that tribe we told you about? They showed up. We tried to chase them off, but it's too late. All your guys were dead. And so Columbus says, okay, I'm going to go find these dudes. So he goes looking for the Canna villages, and he comes to the first village, the Canna village. And when he gets there, he found 49 huts, and they're populated with Taino women. Now, these 49 huts, he's saying, where are the cannabis? We came for the cannabis. And they said, well, they're out on a foraging expedition. They're after food. They went to a neighboring island. They're killing the people there and bringing the food back. And they said, okay, but what are you doing here? And they said, well, we're the sex slaves of the cannabis. They rape us and all the children we produce, they, they eat. We're the food farm for the cannabis. This is how they, they get the food. And Columbus has all these other dudes with them and they're keeping notes on the stuff. And, and, and so the, the ladies explained, they said, look, the cannabis, you gotta understand these people. They love to eat infants and they love to eat full grown men. They don't like eating women and they don't like eating children. And so this is what one of the doctors recorded about what they heard from the Taino women. It says, when the Caribbees take any boys as prisoners, they remove their organs, they fatten the boys until they grow to manhood, and then when they wish to make a great feast, they kill and eat them, for they say the flesh of boys and women is not good to eat. Well, Columbus proceeds to liberate all those Taino women, gets them out of there, gets them away from the village. Uh, he goes on and he finally catches up with, with the Canna people. And at, when they catch up with the Canna people, they engage them, they have a battle. Columbus's guys whip the, the, the cannibals. And, and you gotta remember, this is the age of conquest. This is what was common in the Bible as well. When you had a culture that was so twisted, that was so bent out of shape, you said, just wipe them out. And that's what God told the people when they went in, into Canaan. He said, these guys are so twisted, they sacrifice their kids and what they do, just, just wipe them out. And so in the age of conquest, there was only two things you could do when you defeated an enemy. One was to kill them, and the other was to enslave them. And that's the two options you got. So Columbus's guys essentially wiped out the cannibals. Now that's the genocide that he's being blamed with. By the way, if you ever take a trip to the Caribbean, you can appreciate the fact you're not gonna have to face cannibals when you go there. Thank you, Columbus, for wiping out the cannibals. And how many tribes he saved. He saved all these other tribes that were being pillaged by the cannibals. Nobody talks about all the other tribes he saved that appreciated Columbus. They actually joined with Columbus to help fight these people. So today, I, I think it's, we could maybe understand in terms of ISIS. You remember four years ago is when they really came to power, tried to set up the caliphate in Iraq. We got introduced to them specifically on the shores there of the Mediterranean when they beheaded the Coptic Christians. Who are these guys? This is barbaric. And so we went in over the next three years, we proceeded to eliminate the ISIS caliphate. And, you know, I've talked to a lot of special forces guys. I got two kids in the military right now. And so what we're doing with Afghanistan, dealing with special forces guys, it's interesting. You would be shocked at how many ISIS terrorists were killed in that period of time. State Department doesn't make it public. Department of Defense doesn't make it public. It's unbelievable the number of people who want to blow up others and kill others and kill you. You know, the guys like last week I told you in that Bible study that the ISIS fighters are back in Afghanistan. They're the Hagagi guys that are mainly at the Kabul airport, that region, and that's where they were killed. So these guys are making a comeback. You know, we wiped them out so much. We just knocked them down for years. Now they're coming back. But nobody accuses us of genocide for wiping out the ISIS fighters. That's, even the liberal media doesn't say it was a genocide to wipe out ISIS fighters. See, that's what it was with Columbus back in that day. These guys were so twisted, so abominable, nobody lamented their passing. 
The whole world was better off when it happened. So after Columbus liberates the, the Taino and, and crushes the cannabis, he heads back to Spain. And as he goes back to Spain, some of the Taino say, you know, you keep talking to us about this king and queen. You say they're really great people. We'd love to go back and meet them. And so some of the Tainos voluntarily asked to go back. This was not enslavement. They wanted to go back. And it's interesting, the king and queen made them part of the royal court. They said, these guys are so great. Let's just make them part of the royal proceedings. And so they had elevated positions. Now, Columbus did take back a handful of cannibals with him. And he said, these are the guys that ate my men. These are the guys that ate our friends. And so that's the enslavement, is when he took back a handful of these cannibals to Spain to show the king and queen how twisted things were there in the Caribbean. That's the enslavement we're talking about. He didn't enslave any others, just the, the few that he didn't kill when he, when he had his genocide. That's not the story we get at all. And we're tearing statues down because of that. See, that's why previous generations erected statues to him because he moved civilization forward. Now, Columbus's guys weren't always good. Columbus fought his own men many times. He told his men, you cannot take any gold from the Tainos. You have to give them something of equal value in exchange. His men didn't like that. The Tainos are willing to give them everything. So Columbus fought with his own men over the treatment of natives. It was not Columbus. And the Spanish got a lot of things wrong. Columbus was a whole lot better than the Spanish. Actually, he was Italian. And so when you look at Columbus, the real story is quite different from what we're told, but that's not all the charges against him. Another charge we hear about him is that he was driven only by gold. It was his love of money that caused him to do all that he did. Well, that love of money, what if there's more to that story than there was to the first story? Because we're told he's a genocidal guy who started sex trafficking. What if there's more to the story? So to find out if there's more to the story, you've got to go back to Columbus today and see what it's like. At the time he lived, it's part of when the Crusades occurred. Now, we hear about the Crusades. We study them in American uh, books today, world history, world geography. We'll study about the Crusades. Most people can't answer three basic, basic questions about the Crusades. The questions about the Crusades, when you talk about the Crusades, you should be able to say who was involved, where did the Crusades occur, and why did they occur? Now, let me take you back and, and, and look at that because this is the age of Columbus. This is the age in which he lived. When you look at the Crusades, what the textbooks talk about today is the Christian Crusades. They occurred primarily in the Middle East and they're from eight to 37 Crusades depending on which textbook you read. So what happens is, to, and, and by the way, I'm appointed in a bunch of states by state boards of education to do the history and social studies standards in those states. So I see what's in the textbooks. And so we say these intolerant Christians, they went and they butchered people and they killed people and they tried to overcome people. And that's what the Crusades are all about from eight to 37. And yes, Christians did some bad stuff back then, no question about it. Because back then we didn't have the Bible available. We had not gotten to the Reformation yet. We've gone through about a thousand years where the Bible has been put up from the average citizen. It's only used by those that are elites in church and state, and they tell us what we should be believing, and we don't get it for ourselves. So the Reformation comes after this. So at this point in time, these, these wicked Christians are trying to kill all the people who don't believe. Them. Okay, so the question is, who are they fighting? Well, they were fighting in the Muslim Crusades. And by the way, let's talk about the Muslim Crusades for a moment. Do you know in the Muslim Crusades, there were a total of 548 Muslim Crusades? Now, how come we hear about the 37 or so Christian Crusades and not a word about the Muslim Crusades? See, the Christian Crusades were Christians trying to take back what the Muslims had taken from the Christians. It was a return conflict. And so you go to the second, third, fourth, eighth crusade. They're all trying to take back stuff that was taken. And if you know much about Muslim Crusades, and by the way, let me point out that Columbus is from Italy. There's Italy right there. Italy was besieged because in the Muslim faith, you have to conquer your enemy. So Jews and Christians, particularly on that list. And so since Paul went into Rome, that's the book of Romans, there in Rome, and there were big churches in Italy and big cathedrals by that point in time, that's where Muslims are going to conquer them. So Columbus in his youth grew up fighting Muslims who were coming to kill him and his friends and the churches he attended. So this is a very real thing to him. This is not book learning. This is something that's going on where they come into his land trying to conquer and kill. And by the way, he is sailing for the nation of Spain. Look at Spain, it's nothing but red dots. See, this is where Paul went on his missionary journey and got churches started in Spain. Spain was a thriving Christian area. And so the Muslims really attacked Spain. And so the, the 
king and queen of Spain are very aware of what's happening with this because they're having to fight wars over it. And the other place you see so much activity is there in the Middle East because this was the home of Christians and Jews. And so, so many of the, the holy sites, the Christian Jews had to be conquered, taken over. And if you know much about the Islamic faith back in that day, when they conquered something, they would erect a minaret and a mosque there to show we've conquered this. This is why so many people were ticked after 9-11 when they wanted to build a mosque on the side of 9-11. People said, well, religious toleration is what we do in America. No, if you understand history, we erect this mosque and this minaret where we've conquered a people. And so that's why people didn't like what happened in 9-11. So what happens if you go across the Middle East, if you've ever been there, you know, Caesarea is where Paul set out his missionary journey. It's a big Christian port. And it's also one that was conquered in the Crusades. And they built a, a minaret and a mosque there. If you go on across uh, to, to Bethlehem, this is the birthplace of King David. It's the birthplace of, of Jesus. It is now a Muslim town. It's been conquered because it was a Christian Jewish holy site. And it's now got the mount, mosque and minaret there. Uh, it's, a, it's a Muslim town today. So is Nazareth, the boyhood home of Jesus. It's one of those that's been conquered and taken over because that was a holy site to Christians. Uh, you have the Temple Mound, which is holy to both Christians and Jews. It's now the third most holy site in Islam because it was conquered and taken over in the Crusades. Uh, even Caesarea Philippi, this is where Jesus told told Peter. He said, Peter, on this rock I'll build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Big stuff for, for Christians. For the Catholic faith, they said that's where Peter became the first pope. This is the birthplace for first pope. This is big stuff to Christians and Protestants both. And so that was conquered in a mosque and a minaret there. And this is the way it was all over the Middle East. And so when Columbus is alive, this is what's going on. This is what he's facing. Well, Columbus interestingly writes a letter where he, in his journal, he talks about how that he has read or talked to the major theologians of the day. He said, all the major theologians agree that Jesus will return within 155 years. Now, don't ask me why 155 years. That was their end time eschatology at the time. All the theologians agreed. He's not a theologian. He believes them. And so he said, if Jesus is coming back, he's coming back there to Jerusalem. And right now, that's a hot bed of conflict. It's, it's a bed of hostility. Jesus comes back there. I mean, it's going to be nothing but war because he says, we've got to get this back in the hands of people who love him. We've got to get it back in the hands of Christians and Jews. And so that's why he wants the gold. It's interesting. What he told the king and queen was very pointed. He said, I wish that all the prophets of this my endeavor may be sent in the conquest of Jerusalem. He's not getting money to build a 43-story castle that he can live in. He wants that money to be able to get the Middle East back in the hands of those who love God and get it out of the hands of those who, who hate Christians and Jews. That's a whole different motivation. Now, we can argue and say, well, I'm not sure that's a sound motivation. Okay, that's fine. You can say it's sound. But don't tell me he's greedy and was loving gold and, and wanted all this for himself because that's not what the story is. You can question his motivations, but the story narrative we get today is totally different. And in addition to having his journals, between his third and fourth voyage, he wrote what was called his book of prophecies because he was going through the scriptures. And as he read the scriptures, when the Lord spoke something to him, the Holy Spirit brought something out, he had recorded. And if you can see on the left side there, if you read uh, Latin, it's Ezekiel uh, chapter 3 and Ezekiel chapter 27, Ezekiel on the right side, Ezekiel chapter 28, Ezekiel chapter 32, Ezekiel chapter 34 and 35. He, he's writing notes on the scriptures. And he specifically pointed something to Isaiah. He said, look, my name is Christopher, which means Christ bearer. I think that's a God-given name. He said, when I look into, into Isaiah, it talks about how the light is to go to the isles of the sea. He said, the Isles of the Sea tells me there's people out there that have never heard the light before. There's some islands that need to be found that need the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I think he's called me to do that. So he goes through all the scriptures and he writes about what God has shown him. And he specifically says, I've looked and put into study to look into all the scriptures. Our Lord opened my understanding. I could sense his hand upon me. All those who heard about my enterprise rejected it with laughter, scoffing at me. He said, but who doubts that this illumination is from the Holy Spirit? I attest that he, the Spirit, with marvelous rays of light, consoled me through the holy and sacred scriptures. No one should be afraid to take on any enterprise in the name of our Savior if it's right and if the purpose is purely for his holy service. Now, that's a, that's a motivation we don't hear much, but that's the true story. Now, you take what I've just shown you and put it with the narrative we've got today, and I've got the documents to show you, and I can also take you back to school books we used 30 years ago who had the stuff in the school books. This was common knowledge. It's not common knowledge today, which is why it's okay to tear down the statues because this guy's a bum. Well, he's not perfect. That's why we all need a savior. The Bible says all of sin comes short of the glory of God. Nobody's perfect. But that doesn't mean he's the maniac, genocidal, sex and slaver, whatever that they've got him today. 
We buy that because we don't know what the truth is. So this is where it's important. Proverbs 18, 17 says, one side sounds good until you hear the other. This is the way we run our courts of law. Prosecution gets a shot, the defense gets a shot, the jury has to listen to both sides and say, no, nope, truth is on this side. See, what happens today, we get one side or the other. Whichever media we listen to, if you're on the right, you get that side, if you're on the left, you get that side. We're no longer looking for truth, we're looking for what helps our side to win. And we're wanting our side to win because we don't have this objective love of truth. And I'm not saying you specifically, I'm talking about the nation in whole. I'm talking in general terms here. So love of the truth is the most important thing. Now, with the love of the truth, let me take you back to what we started with, and that's, all right, last 16 months, we've been attacking statues and tearing them down. And the reason we've been attacking and tearing them down, if you just read the narrative, it's about race. This is all to stop racism. We want to get the statues removed that are of all these racists, and that's why we're taking down all these Confederate statues. And that has been the narrative. And if you look on most lists today that list the statues that are taken down, it shows you all these Confederate statues that are taken down. But I've got a problem with that because that's not really what the narrative is about. If it was, then please tell me why the statue of David Farragut in Washington, D.C. was taken down. Because he's a Southern guy who moved north to fight slavery, and he is the commander of all the Union forces all the Navy, the Union Navy and the Confederacy. So if you're telling me the Confederates are the bad guys, he's the guy who defeated the Confederate Navy. Why would you tear his statue down? He's on the other, and why would you tear down the statue of Ulysses S. Grant, who's the military commander in chief who defeated the Confederacy? If you're saying they're the bad guys, he's the guy who whipped them. And then on top of that, my goodness, why go after the Mass 54th? Because that's a black Union regiment, that's an achievement regiment, broke through. As a result of what they did in victories, I actually owned the federal law where the federal government said, Hey, blacks and whites equal. They get equal pay, equal treatment in the military. We're going to have things equal. Why would you go after their statue? And why would you go after Abraham Lincoln? Tear down three statues of Abraham Lincoln so far because he's a racist that owns slaves. No, he never owned slaves. He's the guy who ended slavery, called the great emancipator. And why would you tear down the statue of Frederick Douglass? Uh, what? We've lost our brains. But you see, it's all about fighting racism. Well, uh, then why are you going after the abolitionists and civil rights leaders? And by the way, if you haven't been informed, Jesus is the chief form of racist. I mean, Jesus is a white supremacist. May I point out Jesus wasn't white? I know that may come as a shock to a lot of people. Jesus was not a white guy. That, that's, but we're going after statues and hadn't seen much in the news, but all these statues being torn down and beheaded of Jesus, they particularly are doing that often. Uh, happened recently in Texas, this one in Texas. Uh, and then up in New England, I mean, they've been attacking churches and defacing churches because they're all houses of white supremacy. And so all this stuff going on, uh, the church in Washington, D.C., the church of the presidents, where every president except Washington is attended, they burned that down. When the police and the fire department finally put out the fire, they came back the next week and restarted the fire. We've got to burn this church down. And, and then we're, we're taking down Ten Commandments. That, that's racism as well. And, and then we're burning Bibles. Well, that's where all the racism comes from is out of the Bible. And, and then the, the Armenian Genocide Memorial. Now, if you don't know about the Armenian Genocide Memorial, at the end of World War I, Muslims killed about a million and a half Christians in Armenia, just murdered them. It was a Holocaust, not nearly as big as Hitler's, but it was still a million and a half Christians killed by Muslims at the end of World War I. And one of the famous pictures out of that period is how the Muslims would take young girls and crucify young girls. So, oh, you're a follower of Jesus? Then why don't you just enjoy dying the way he did? And you're gonna tear down the memorial to these victims? Well, I, I, I don't understand. It looks to me like you're going after Christianity and after Christ. It, it doesn't look like racism is the issue. And, and, and then what do you do with attacking the World War I memorial in Pittsburgh and the World War I memorial in Kansas City and the World War I memorial in Birmingham? And why attack the World War II memorial in Washington, D.C.? And why go after the World War II memorial in Indiana? Why go after the World War II memorial in Merced? All these guys from Merced who died in World War II, we got to deface that. And then the World War II memorial in Charlotte. And I can just show you all these war memorials. So apparently the military is a real problem as well. And then you got to get rid of statues like Caesar Rodney. He's a founding father, signed the declaration, except he's an anti-slavery founding father. He's the guy on the back of the Delaware Quarter that we have, but he's got to go. And, and then you've got folks like Ben Franklin. Now, wait a minute. Ben Franklin led the National Abolition Movement. He starts the Abolition Society in Pennsylvania, leads the National Movement. Why are we tearing him down? And, and then, of course, you've got folks like Philip Schuler, the, the great victory at, at Saratoga, first major battle of the revolution. And, and then you've got Kazimierz Pulaski. Now, this is a Polish general who came to America. And Kazimierz Pulaski was 
absolutely anti-slavery. Now, let me point out something. One of the things we don't get today is much history to really know what the American Revolution is like. It was all a bunch of white guys. No, it wasn't. As a matter of fact, we own stacks of books of black heroes, not just black soldiers, black heroes in the war. Now, I'll tell you back in the early founding era, if you had a picture painted of you, it's because you're pretty famous. I mean, it's not like snapshots. We take snapshots of everybody today. If you have a picture painted of you, fairly famous. It is shocking that most Americans today find how many pictures were painted of black heroes back in the founding because they were genuine heroes. Now, we've not heard that. I mean, there were thousands of blacks that fought in the American Revolution. Let me give you a little tone difference here. In the American Revolution, every battle in the American Revolution was integrated soldiers, black and whites fighting side by side, fighting together. Very often they went to church together and it was their church that was out defending the town. The Battle of Lexington was Jonas Clark out, his 73 guys from his church went out there to defend the town from the 700 British. And the guys in his church shot down that morning included black patriots like Prince Estabrook and white patriots like John Robbins. They all went to church together, black and white. Then as you move on through and look past that, the American military back then was a completely volunteer military, and your term of enlistment was six months. So patriotic Americans enlisted. Well, the average white guy enlisted and served six months, and that was it. The average black guy enlisted and served six months and re-enlisted eight more times. On average, blacks served nine times longer in the American Revolution than whites did, and it was a completely voluntary army. So then you look at Washington's generals. He had 76 generals in the Revolution. 28 of those generals came from foreign nations, like Kazimierz Pulaski from Poland. See, it was, not, it was a melting pot even back then. Even the role of Hispanics, I mean, the ladies in Cuba took up collections and, and sent to George Washington to keep his troops in the field. And the Spanish governor of, of West Florida took on the British and won the Battle of Pensacola. I mean, we had so much Hispanic help, so much help from all races, all peoples, all nations. It was a melting pot. And today we're told it's an all-white revolution. By the way, another guy whose statue was torn down, Thaddeus Kosciuszko. He's from Lithuania. Thaddeus Kosciuszko came to America to fight for freedom. George Washington made him a general because he's a great military commander in Lithuania. And he was a wealthy nobleman in Lithuania. And he took all of his money and gave it to fighting slavery in the South. He wanted southern slaves freed and we tear his statue down, and then we go after the statue of the unknown soldier of the American Revolution. Looks to me like we hate the military too. Founding fathers, military, Christian, it just kind of looks like we hate America because we're going after every, but we're told, no, no, it's all about racism. Well, that's what we buy. We want to fight racism, but what we have to recognize, it's not just racists that are being torn down. It's Christians, it's military, it's so many positive things. So this is a lot bigger than what we hear and you have to love the truth. So loving the truth is super important. Now, I'm gonna close this out with the word truth. I'm gonna give you four verbs. You have to love the truth. And if it causes you to have to change your opinion, go where truth is, not where your opinion is. Truth is the most important thing, because if you don't go with truth, the delusion enters, you'll believe a lie, you'll act on it, you'll have bad consequences. So love the truth. But to love the truth, you have to find the truth. And this is now a bunch of hard work. Um, we no longer get the truth the way we used to. We get somebody's agenda now or somebody's belief or somebody's personal opinion. And we've coasted along in America for 30, 40 years. We just kind of coasted and accepted what was out there. And well, I may not agree with that, but, but now it's taken root. And, and so we've had good, you know, our teachers are not trying to lie to us. Our teachers, we can't believe that anymore. Just an example, Columbus. I'm gonna bet that what I shared this morning is new to 95% of you about Columbus. But it's true, it's documented, it's what previous generations knew. That means you're gonna to have to spend some time to go back and find facts because you didn't get it in school, you didn't get it in media. You're gonna to have to spend some individual time, which means some hard work to go discover the truth. You need to find out what you believe and what it's based on. Is it built on the right stuff? And, and while, I can, while I'm here, let me throw out this guy, John Clum. John Clum is uh, a Moravian, he, Moravian brethren, he's a strong Christian. When Ulysses S. Grant was president of the United States, America was in westward expansion, moving out to the west. The Indian reservations, the agents on those Indian re reservations were overwhelmingly corrupt. And there was so much problem that the bureaucracy brought to the native tribes as we went west. And so what happens, Ulysses S. Grant said, you know, go back to the time of the founding fathers, when there was a reservation, when there was a treaty made with a native tribe, we always put a Christian denomination to work out because a Christian denomination is gonna seek integrity and gonna do the right thing and not gonna steal and cheat. And so back at the time of Washington and Adams and all those guys, 
Indian, Indian reservations, Indian places, they were always with a church beside them, caring for them, making sure things were right. So Ulysses S. Grant said, that's a good thing to do. So they went to the, he went to the Moravian Brethren Church and said, the Apache Reservation in New Mexico, he's, or in Arizona, the Apache Reservation in Arizona, would the Moravian Brethren denomination please take that? And they said, yes, we will. We'll be happy to go down there and fight corruption, make sure those people are treated well and justly, make sure that everything's right. And so they chose John Clum as the agent to go down there. John Clum went down there, totally reorganized the Apache Reservation. Instead of them being subjects to the United States, he says, no, all men are created equal. There's equality. Um, he set up the police force of the Apaches. They policed their own thing. They made their own laws. They had their own legislature. It wasn't the U.S. telling them what to do. He set up self-government among them. It's great stuff. Matter of fact, he's the only guy in the United States that ever caught Geronimo. The, the cavalry chased Geronimo for 20 years, never got him. But what happened was he had 100 members of the Apache police force, and the Apache police force went out and catch Geronimo because Geronimo was murdering Apaches as well as white guys as well as everybody. Geronimo was just lawless. And so the Apache police force, under John Clum is, or the ones who caught Geronimo. So John Clum did so much good stuff there and then after that he went on to Tombstone, Arizona and he started the Tombstone Epitaph. He's the guy that tells us about the gunfight at the Old K Corral. It's his newspaper. He was friends with the herbs and he knew about the clans and so much Western history came from this Christian dude. I mean he is really a man of integrity and character. And there's another guy, and I was, I, we write books and have a lot of history stuff, and so I was writing about John Clum, and I knew a lot of the story, and I'm just looking up to see some more details. And I was doing the same thing with Cecil B. DeMille. Cecil B. DeMille started Paramount Studios. He started Paramount Studios, and amazingly, he's called the father of biblical epic. He talks about his Christian testimony, why he got into entertainment, what it did for him. Um, back in the days of silent films, he did the movie King of Kings, which is the story of Jesus Christ. There were 3.5 billion people in the world at that point in time. One billion people saw that film. One billion people saw the life of Christ that he produced out of Hollywood. He goes on to become the father of what's called the biblical epic. Uh, so he's, he did movies like The Ten Commandments, and you know, you'll famous Martha Ray and, and, and um, Yule Brenner and Charlton Heston, all these guys. He won so many Academy Awards, he did 81 movies. And with the movie Ten Commandments, it was so cool. He went on scene to Egypt and actually built, built the set there in Egypt, had 9,000 extras in the movie. I mean, that's why he's called the father of biblical epic. But after they did the movie Ten Commandments, they said, you know, the nation needs Ten Commandments. So he and Charlton Heston, Yule Brenner were able to get copies of the Ten Commandments put into 4,000 schoolhouses, got them in the schoolhouses, and they said, we need it across the United States, so they started building marble monuments across the United States and put 180 of them up. They went to each state capital, put up Ten Commandments monuments at the state capital, put up at major cities. Uh, this Ten Commandments monument happens to be, I think Charlton Heston helped put this up at the Texas state capital. This is the one that the U.S. Supreme Court upheld in 2007, says it is okay to have Ten Commandments in public, and that's the monument. Well, that was from Cecil B. the Mill. So I knew his faith, I knew about his stuff, and knew the movies he'd produced. And so I, what I did was I said, I want to find out more, so I jumped on my search service, and I used Bing, and so I jump on there and I write in John Clum, Christian, and I write a search for uh, Cecil B. DeMille, Christian. No pages, there's nothing. I said, what? I know better than that. I said, I wonder. And so I just decided to go duck, duck, go. <laughs> I, I did the same search and came up with pages and pages and pages and pages. So now even big tech is not allowing us to see stuff that might be Christian or show the history in a different way. So you're gonna to have to work hard. If you wanna find the truth, you can't coast and you can't wait for somebody to give it to you. You're gonna to to, to have to be diligent. You might actually have to go to the library and read an old book rather than something online because old books actually had a history and content in them. So uh, hard work is there. So all that to say, finding the truth is, is what has to be done. That's the second verb. The third verb I would use is defending the truth. Now, defending the truth requires a lot of courage, and that's a tough thing today. We have polling now that says 77% of Americans now self-censor due to the current political climate. I know this is what I believe, but if I say that, I'm gonna get shot down, or I'll get deplatformed, or whatever, or they're gonna get ticked at me, and I'll get all these posts back, and so we kind of soften it up and maybe hint. We don't have the same backbone we used to have because the climate where you get attacked for standing up for what's true because it's not necessarily popular. 
it's interesting that when you look in the scriptures, the scriptures tell us so much about life. They tell us about heaven and hell. We know you get to heaven through Jesus Christ, John 14, 6, no way to heaven except through Jesus. But we also know about hell. And, and the Bible teaches us a lot about hell. And it is a real place. And a lot of people today deny that there is such a place as hell. That's just uh, hardships that we go through. And there's all sorts of things out there. But the Bible says there is an actual place called hell. Revelation 21, 8 says there's a lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. It is a genuine, it is a real place. Place. The Bible talks about it. It also tells us who goes to hell. It says that the faithless and the testable and the murderers and the sexually immoral and the sorcerers and the idolaters and all those, ooh, that's some bad dudes. Liars and murderers, and look what they do that puts them in hell. Except you may notice it's a blank spot up there. There's something missing. What is missing is the first part of the verse. The first part of the verse of those that God sends to hell, it says, cowards and fearful. That, whoa, I don't consider them like murderers and, and sorcerers and liars. See, the other guys go to hell for what they do. These guys go to hell for what they didn't do. And what they didn't do was have a backbone. They didn't stand up, cowards and fearful. And that's where we have to change our attitude. Christianity is not a weak, namby pamby religion. We have to get a backbone and start defending our beliefs and our values. So it, it takes courage. Um, and, and, you know, quite frankly, in this world, all right, I get attacked all the time. I mean, groups spend millions on me on a regular basis. I got a call from US News World Report. Hey, did you know the, US, the ACLU just spent a million dollars to credit you? Great, that's a million they can't spend sending us suing a school district. You know, great, let them go out. I mean, you will get beat up. I, I don't even read my own. When I read my own Wikipedia page, I hate myself. It, it's terrible. You know, it's just, so you will get. We just got deplatformed. We have a, a national radio program, about 400 stations carry it, but hundreds of thousands of podcasts. And so we had a, a, a Supreme Court attorney on who just won a big federal case. And the big federal case was out of Alabama where that a dental school in Alabama was requiring all students to have vaccinations, COVID vaccination requirement. Well, it went to court and won that. And not only did he win it, we're winning those courts, those cases all over the United States and federal courts because as he pointed out, And, and by the way, I'm not saying that you gotta do this, you can't be vaccinated. I'm not saying that at all, I'm just telling you. What happened was when the state of Alabama said, or the dental school said, you have to be vaccinated, the court says, no you don't. And you see, when you, we were talking to him, and said, all right, what's the current status of the law? He said, well, currently, all 50 states give, vac give exemptions for vaccines. He said 46 states give exemptions, conscience exemptions for vaccines, and 26 states provide religious exemptions for vaccines. Okay, so the law says in all 50 states there are exemptions, 46 states say there are conscience exemptions, 26 states say there are religious exemptions, and so the federal court says this is what the law is. For that program, where we just reported, YouTube quickly took us down for a week, got a strike, we were deplatformed and all this, Wait a minute, we didn't give any opinions on there. We told what the court decision was, and we told you what the law was in every state, and we got the platform for telling the truth? Absolutely. And it wasn't even an opinion program. It was just simply, here's what's happened, here's a news report. So the, the stuff now, it takes a lot of courage to tell the truth. Then you have to tell others the truth. Once you find out about this stuff, you cannot assume people around you know what you know or what you've learned. I've made a new discovery. You can't assume anybody else is getting that. So you have to share this and tell this with others. So the, the things with, with truth, truth is the big word this morning. Uh, I would tell you that you have to love the truth. You have to find the truth, which takes hard work. Then you have to defend the truth and then you have to share the truth with others. And if we do that, we can see things turn around. But if we remain silent and don't have a backbone, it's not gonna turn. And by the way, if this, if this is, New information for you. Uh, I'd send you the book we have that, that's called The American Story, which covers everything from Columbus up, up through the end of slavery. Uh, also, the Founder's Bible filled with stories from American history, how the Bible shaped and influenced things positively. So a lot of good information. Thank you guys for letting me share with you. God bless. <laughs>